Okay, let's take a look at another main point, main conclusion question, which one of the following expresses the main conclusion in the argument. Let's we'll start by reading the stimulus. Double blind techniques should be used whenever possible in scientific experiments. See, this word hopefully didn't just fly under your radar. If when you were reading the sentence with me the first time, this set off alarm bells, that's good. That means you have a nose for it, right? That means you have a sensitivity towards prescriptive claims. Whenever I read prescriptive claims, I almost can't help but ask why. Why should double-blind techniques be used whenever possible? I want to be convinced, in other words, that double-blind techniques should be used whenever possible. If you have this feeling as well, that means what you're doing is you're hypothesizing this to be the conclusion. In other words, you're kind of guessing already that this is the conclusion. What you expect to read as you read on is you expect to find premises trying to back up this idea that double-blind techniques should be used whenever possible, trying to, in other words, support this claim. Okay, so now this is just a guess. This is just a, I read this, I'm by gut instinct, I'm asking myself, why should I believe this? So I'm making this guess that, okay, what the author will do from here on out is try to convince me of this claim, which means that I'm guessing the rest of it is premise. This is conclusion. Now, that's merely a hypothesis. You have to verify with or by, rather, by reading the remainder of the stimulus, right? So let's see if our hypothesis is borne out by the observation, by the empirical observation here. Let's see, they, referential phrase, right? Referential phrase referring to what? The double-blind techniques, right? That's what the they refers to. They help prevent the misinterpretations that often arise due to expectations and opinions that scientists already hold. So Double-blind techniques help prevent certain, what do you want to say, right? These are just mistakes, right? Do you see, this is just a really like detailed account of what kind of mistake we're dealing with. You know, like in a simplified world where the grammar was less difficult, the sentence would just read, double-blind techniques help prevent mistakes, full stop, or misinterpretations, full stop. Right, but hmm, okay, we're in a more complicated world where the sentence told us details of what kind of mistake we're dealing with. First of all, it's a misinterpretation, not just any misinterpretation, it's a misinterpretation that often arises due to expectations and opinions that scientists already hold. Right? So we're talking about the the kind of misinterpretations that arise owing to scientists' biases. Right? Not like, say, for example, scientists' carelessness. Right? That could be a misinterpretation. They're just careless. But that's not what we're talking about. Okay? So it's really important to be able to do this kind of grammatical analysis where you shed all the details. Okay? Shed all the grammatical details so you understand what the like, high-level sentence is saying. But then simultaneously add in all the details so you understand at a granular level what the sentence is saying as well. And in a future lesson, I'll get more into that grammar point specifically. Okay, so let's keep going. So far, it seems like it is bearing on our hypothesis. We're saying double-blind techniques should be used whenever possible. Why? Well, because they prevent mistakes. And clearly, scientists should avoid those mistakes, should be extremely diligent in avoiding such mistakes. Oh, great. See, now the hypothesis borns out, is borne out, rather, and I am very confident that this, in fact, is the conclusion. And we're going to do a couple of things here that is, uh, strictly speaking, not necessary to get the point on this question. But hopefully by now, this goes without saying, we're not trying to just get the point, right? This point doesn't count. We're just using these questions as cannon fodder, so to speak, to figure out the theory that explains not this question, but future questions, right? Be they on LR or here, I'm going to make a point that's actually, of course, relevant for LR, but anticipates a lot of what you need to do for reading comp as well, All right? So, I'm going to abstract away from the specifics of this argument and construct our abstract version of premise, premise, conclusion. And I'm going to say that one of my premises is that we should, scientists should, right? Should what? I'm going to just shed all the details here and just put it in a box. We should box, right? Okay, what's inside the box? Let's open the box and examine the contents. Well, if you open the box up, what you would find inside the box is that Scientists should avoid mistakes. And notice I didn't open the box all the way, right? Because I'm still shedding a lot of details. It's like I've opened the box and I've taken out a slightly uh, more detailed box. But you can open this box up some more. You can be like, okay, 
Avoid what kind of mistakes? Well, mistakes that arise due to expectations and opinion the scientists already hold. See, referential phrasing, once again, such misinterpretations, right? Referencing this kind of misinterpretation. Okay, so I'm not going to do that. I just want to keep it as a uh, sort of, again, at the high level, very simple. We should do this, right? And, and this other premise is they help prevent this, right? And the, the they here being double blind techniques, I'm also just going to put into a box. I'm going to put into a different shaped box because, well, the contents are different. Double blind techniques is not the same thing as avoiding misinterpretations that arise out of expectations and opinions the scientists already hold. So here are just double blind techniques. What about double blind techniques? Well, they help, right? They help what? They help precisely to achieve the box, right? They help this. We should be striving for whatever's in this box. This triangle thing helps to achieve this box thing. So conclusion, we should triangle. Right? And again, if you open up the triangle, you'll find what's inside is double blind techniques. So see the abstract nature of the abstract form of this argument is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. We lay out a goal, right? We should achieve, and that's what I mean by goal. We say that we should do this. Notice this is a prescriptive claim. We then lay out something that helps us achieve that goal. And we conclude that we therefore should utilize that something. As you encounter more and more logical reasoning questions, your ability to abstract away from the particulars of one argument over to the general form of the argument will improve simply because you've seen so many arguments. I don't know where you are in your LSAT prep right now if you are, say, just starting out. Obviously, it's just like, I don't think you can, I mean, at least it won't be easy for you to do this. Perhaps you can, right? And that, that's actually really great if you already can. But as you do more and more of, logical, of the logical reasoning, you get more exposed to these arguments, you're going to start to see that the forms repeat, right? The forms repeat. And I already mentioned this, but this is true for RC as well. You're going to have to do this at a paragraph by paragraph level. Notice what the general form of the whole passage is, how they construct the, the argument moving from paragraph one to paragraph two to paragraph three. Okay, so that's one point I want to make about it. Better way for you to get more juice out of these logical reasoning questions as you're studying for the test. Now, again, I, this, is, this is like not something you're going to do when the clock is ticking, obviously. But when you're studying, this is something I want you to do because it is analogous to training with ankle weights on, right? Like if you're training to run long distance, you wear ankle weights. Why? Because come race day, you throw those ankle weights out and you're just faster, okay? Because you're trained at an added level of difficulty. That's the point, okay? So the technique is to consider the answers one by one in isolation and see if they answer, if this answer uh, is the correct answer for the question. This is harder than if you get to look at all the answers together because when you get to look at all the answers together, you get to eliminate answers on the basis of like, well, C is not as good as D, right? Or E is better than A, so I'm getting rid of A. By looking at the answers one by one, you don't let yourself do that. You have to evaluate each answer choice on its own merits. And that's a really important skill to learn, okay? So just so that we're absolutely clear about this, whatever the difficulty of question 10, I'm amping it way up by doing this. And this is something I encourage you all to do whenever you can. Well, because, you know, it's like training with ankle weights on, right? So now let's look at answer choice C. It's a main point, main conclusion question. We've already identified the conclusion to be this. Now the question is just, does this say the same thing as this? And the answer is no, it doesn't. This is saying double blind techniques should be used whenever possible in scientific experiments. This is just faulting scientists. This is saying scientists sometimes, you know, commit this error, neglect to adequately do something, right? You're at fault, bad scientist. This is saying scientists should do something. I mean, you can, the noun here is double blind techniques should be used, but presumably it's used by whom, right? By scientists, obviously, right? So you should say scientists should use double blind techniques whenever possible. Do you see like the, just at a high level without, notice uh, I didn't, get into the nitty gritty of grammar analysis, right? I didn't get into like what in, in like what precise way are they neglecting adequately to do what? And I didn't do that because it wasn't necessary. So right there, I've thrown in some techniques about efficiency, about time saving, right? Now, of course, we're studying for this. We should use this opportunity to analyze and deconstruct the grammar of this, right? Let's do that. Some scientists sometimes neglect to adequately consider what? 
consider the risks. Risks of what? Of misinterpreting evidence, right? M how? Like misinterpreting evidence because you're careless? No, misinterpreting evidence on the basis of your biases, of your prior expectations and opinions, right? So we're saying sci scientists sometimes just don't even consider what the risks of this thing is, right? They neglect to adequately consider the risk. Okay, so C is not the right answer. How about A? Scientists' objectivity may be impeded by interpreting experimental evidence on the basis of excitations and opinions that they already hold. Also, no, right? No, it's not the right answer. And you might have a very easy explanation for why. If you recall the previous lesson on descriptive versus prescriptive, if you look at our conclusion, it's a uh, straight up prescriptive conclusion. Scientists should do this, right? Double blind techniques should be used. Here, this is a descriptive claim. Is it a bad thing that their objectivity is being impeded? Is it a good thing that their objectivity is impeded? Should we do anything to stop this impediment of their objectivity? A is merely reporting to us, describing to us the way the world is. You have scientists in this world. They have objectivity. Sometimes their objectivity is impeded by this thing. That's it. Merely descriptive. So at the highest level, it does not fit. Once again, that's a technique of efficiency, eliminating an answer choice but without having to dive into the nitty gritty details of what in the world is this saying, because at the highest level, this can't be the right answer. Okay, so for this one, I guess I'll, I'll just skip the uh, grammar. There's uh, too much. I actually want to get through uh, the rest of the answers. Let's consider D now, which um, does include, right, at the high level, you see how D passes the high level test? In that sense, D is a better answer choice than A. I'm not saying it's the correct answer choice. It might be correct, it might be incorrect. The point I want to make is that there are gradations between wrong answer choices. Some answer choices are better than others. Some are worse than others because they just, you know, as you can see, D at least passes this, you know, first, first pass. Right? Are you at least a prescriptive claim? Because my conclusion is a prescriptive claim, so I'm going to be looking for a prescriptive claim. And D's like, yep, I'm at least a prescriptive claim. Whenever it's possible, scientists should what? Right? You can make D the correct answer choice by just changing these words. Whenever possible, scientists should utilize double-blind techniques, period. Right? Okay, that would be pretty good. That would be a pretty good answer choice, but that's not what D is saying. D is saying whenever possible, scientists should not interpret evidence on the basis. Well, yeah, that, that is right. And this is that error, you know, that we already encountered from a previous main point question where I mentioned that the outside writers like to do this thing where they, you know, they just kind of repeat in a trap wrong answer choice the last bit of the stimulus, the last thing that you read. You know, scientists should be extremely diligent in avoiding misinterpretations that arise due to expectations and opinions that they already hold. Like, that's the last thing you read? So the outside writer's thinking goes something like this. I bet some subset of test takers will just take the last thing they read because that's the thing closest chronologically to when they are considering the answer choices, and they're just going to think that's the conclusion, right? And they're right. You know, something like, well, at least according to our data, 5% of students choose this answer choice. This is not the right answer choice. So now if you're thinking, does that mean I get to automatically eliminate every single answer choice that merely parrots the last bit of the stimulus in a main point, main conclusion question? The answer is no, because sometimes, you know, and this is, the outside writers won't let you game the system. Sometimes they actually do throw the actual conclusion into the last claim of the stimulus. If that's the case, then yeah, then the, you know, the last claim is the conclusion claim. So you're going to find the answer choice that parrots the last claim. Okay. It just... My point is, it's just not a reliable technique if that's what you're thinking, right? The reliable technique is just to actually identify premise, conclusion, and once you identify the conclusion, wherever it may be, find the best paraphrasing of the conclusion in the answers. Okay, now let's look at answer choice E. Double-blind experimental techniques are often an effective way of ensuring scientific objectivity. Surely this is the right answer choice. I mean, it has the very same noun, Right, and it sounds like exactly the thing that we're trying to do, right? Double blind techniques, that's the triangle thing. That's how we can avoid, right? Avoid the misinterpretations that arise rather from biases. In other words, effective way of ensuring objectivity. 
And in a sense, yes. I mean, yes, in the sense that answer choice E does capture this claim, right? In other words, does capture this claim. If you look at answer choice E, double blind te experimental techniques, that's what we call the triangle thing, right? Do what? Are often an effective way of, of what? I mean, this is just a different way to say box, right? Remember, box is avoid the subjective biases. Well, another way to think of that is just ensure objectivity. So all answer choice E is saying is triangle helps to achieve box. Well, that's a premise. That's not a conclusion. Okay, so once again, we're seeing a very effective trap that we've seen before. With wrong answer choices, you're starting to see, hopefully you're starting to see, how the outside writers use the same molds to cut out, to stamp out these attractive wrong answer choices, right? This is merely a repetition of a premise. Okay, so that's one way to see, to understand answer choice E. Um, another way has to do, maybe, maybe some of you notice this, um, it's uh, descriptive versus prescriptive, right? We have a prescriptive claim in our conclusion. We need to say something should be the case, something ought to be the case. But E merely describes the world. In our world, we have this thing called double-blind experimental techniques. What about these techniques? Well, they often are effective of, uh, way of ensuring this. Okay, does that mean we should do it? Well, that depends on whether you want to achieve this goal. If you want to achieve this goal, you should do it, right? If you don't want to achieve this goal, then perhaps you shouldn't do it. You see, so descriptive level, whereas our conclusion exists at a prescriptive level. So at, at that mismatch, you can eliminate answer choice E. If you were to guess how many people thought, what percentage of students thought E was the right answer, it might surprise you to know that 27% chose E as the right answer, even though E is so wrong for what I hope now is a fairly clear reason, right? Descriptive language, prescriptive language, not the same thing. So finally, with one answer choice left, of course, this is the right answer choice. And you might think, well, hold on a second. I thought you said it had to be uh, prescriptive, but this is clearly descriptive, isn't it? It is advisable for scientists to use. And once again, we encounter this recurring theme on the LSAT, which is that the test writers are really good at manipulating the language of English to say the same thing using different words. Remember what distinguishes is from ought? Right? I gave you many different ways to think about it, one of which was think about on the one hand as descriptive, the other hand as prescriptive. You know, another way to think about it is just merely observational. The other is like where you judge, pass judgment, right? where you, you inject your value of how things should be. Take a look at this sentence. Yes, the verb here is is, which sounds like it should squarely be in the prescriptive world. Is there anything in here, though, that actually reveals some kind of judgment? some kind of value, this word. It is advisable for scientists to use double-blind techniques. How can you rephrase, right? Like, instead of saying, it is advisable for scientists to use double, what's another way to say that? It is recommended that, sure, you can say that. It would be a good thing if scientists use double-blind, you could say that. All of those are just different ways of saying scientists should, right? Should or ought. Because, it, I mean, like, what else does it mean if, if you look at the word advisable, right, or recommended, or it is good, it reveals value. We're giving prescriptions. Hey, scientists, I'm prescribing to you this, right, this course of action. Hopefully your takeaway from this question isn't just like, okay, I got the answer right and, you know, whatever, but rather I want you to see something that we, we've only done like three questions, right? And it's already been recurring for each of those three questions. The outside writers have this uncanny ability to hide what it is that they're really saying. So for you, your ability to see past that veil, right, that cover, that obfuscation, to clearly see through to what it is that they're actually saying, that's the ability I want you to hone and sharpen because that's going to make the difference.